Well, welcome to Culturally Appropriate Episode 6. We are excited to kick off the fall season. We have a little bit different show today. Our first guest is going to be Stephanie Center from Stephanie Center Wellness. And she's going to talk to us about functional medicine, especially as we are moving into a different season where allergies and all kinds of other ailments are going to be plaguing us. Next, we're going to do a post-mortem on the summer blockbuster season with our special guest, Jay Curtis Miller, a local filmmaker. And finally, I will be giving the weekly film rundown, as always, as our last segment. So let's go ahead and get started. My first guest is Stephanie Center, and she has had a very interesting health journey. I wanted to bring her on the show just so we can vary what we talk about a little bit more than just movies and pop culture. So, you know, this is becoming a big movement, especially over the past three years in terms of alternative medicines, holistic medicines, natural remedies, functional medicine. So Stephanie, welcome to the show. How are you? Hey, Jared. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Well, I'm very glad you're here too. So I want to begin with a little bit about your story, because when I met you about five years ago, you were an occupational therapist. And then over the course of that time, you have sort of moved into functional medicine while starting your own business. So what led to your decision to move from occupational therapy to functional medicine and all of these other cures and uh, holistic issues with health? You know, us in the functional medicine space, we, we kid around and we say we didn't get here because traditional medicine worked for us, right? So we're, we're a special breed and that's not to be disparaging towards traditional medicine. I think there's certainly a time and a place for it, but it didn't help me solve my problem. And my problem was I had a mold exposure. I had black mold in my body and all of the prescription medications you take for different symptoms don't cure that root cause of the problem, right? I was living in a house that had mold. So until I moved out of that house, I wasn't going to heal. And you can expect that my first or 17th doctor did not think to test me for mold. And so I had to look for, for things on my own. And um, most people don't know this, but doctors are not gatekeepers to lab testing. So we can order our own labs. And as long as you find somebody who knows how to interpret them and help you understand what your labs mean, you can begin to ask better questions and find the right labs. How many of us have gone to the doctor with symptom X and your doctor says to you, well, your labs are normal. Well, that blows because you still don't feel well, right? So maybe we didn't look at the right labs. And so uh, functional medicine was, I, I didn't choose to transition to it. I was forced to because I wanted to solve my problem and I wasn't getting anywhere doing the strategies that I was doing with traditional medicine. So there's a lot of terms that are bandied about for people. I mean, I've seen alternative medicine festivals, bulk medicine festivals, which I covered mm -hmm. with a pamphlet here last June, functional medicine. So can you help us sort of parse out some of this terminology? Yeah, yeah, functional medicine, the idea, and, and you know, there are pros and cons to every approach that we take. You know, functional medicine is not the perfect fit for every person, but functional medicine, the idea is to get to the root cause of why you are having a symptom or why you are experiencing an autoimmune condition so that we can heal from the bottom up because it's a lot easier to solve a problem when you know what's causing it. So that's the idea behind functional medicine. Whereas when you go to a traditional medicine doctor, they're gonna say, oh, I'm so sorry, you have hypothyroidism. Here, take this pill for the rest of your life to manage your symptoms. I'm so sorry, this is what your life looks like from now on. And that's a little doom and gloom. So I would say functional medicine tends to be a little bit more empowering, gives you back the driver's seat to your health. And it, it tends to be a little bit more holistic, meaning it's gonna look at your whole body. It's not going to look, it, it's not, doesn't operate in silos, right? And I think that's another maybe limitation of traditional medicine is your nephrologist isn't talking to your you know, your endocrinologist who's not talking to your dermatologist, who's not talking to your primary care. And before you know it, you're on eight different meds and they all might conflict with each other and you don't have that continuity of care. I like that, that phrase, continuity of care. So what services in particular do you offer and in what areas of health? I tend to serve women. Sorry, Jared. <laughs> I need all the help I can get. So I, I just have a heart for women, especially mamas. I feel like mamas just have everything and they give, give, give all of themselves all the time and just kind of feel depleted. But I, I focus on gut and hormone health because that's where I see the most opportunity for 
um, for growth for, for women. I, I feel like a lot of us with, and we can talk about environmental toxins all day long. That's a huge issue that really impacts our gut health and your hormones are processed in your gut. So if you think you have a hormone problem, I might start with your gut because if you have a hormone problem, you definitely have a gut problem. And the labs that we use give us pages and pages and pages of data to help you understand what's going on in your body. So instead of taking like some random probiotic, we can say, oh no, here are the bacteria that you're low in, here are the bacteria you're high in, here's some foods that feed those bacteria, here's a probiotic that's good for the, the things you're low in, if you even, I don't usually even recommend a probiotic. Um, so we can work smarter and not harder to solving those gut issues. And then as a result of that, your hormones will get better. Uh, but if they're not, I also do hormone testing. And I look at, I do a urine-based test that you do in the comfort of your own home, where we can look at not just your hormones, but how your body metabolizes them, because you have agency over that. You have agency over how your body metabolizes hormones. And most people don't know that. And they don't even know that they should care about that, because that has a huge impact on your health. So what type of clientele do your services attract? I mean, I know that there are some people that might be at the end of their rope after you know getting billed $300 for a random <laughs> checkup, or are these people that are already kind of in tune with more natural solutions and in tune with, or have an antipathy toward big pharma, or is it kind of a mix of, of both for you? Um, I would say, I want to say, I did data on this once. I think the average number of doctors a client of mine has seen before coming to me is seven. That's the average number. Um, yeah, they're at the end of their rope. They're tired of being tired. They're tired of being told. A lot of them, a lot of women um, that I see have, they're kind of given, I hate to use the term gas gaslighting, but they go to the doctor because they don't feel good. And then they're told, well, it's all in your head because your labs are normal. There's nothing wrong with you. Go home. And that's so discouraging when you're like, no, I know I feel like something's off. Um, because it's it's really it's not in your head. Your symptoms are always valid, no matter what, no matter what your health concerns are. They're always valid. And maybe if your labs are normal, we're looking at the wrong labs. Because if you don't feel normal, you're not. And that's something that Davis and I joke a lot about that the pamphleteer would never have existed if it wasn't for the pandemic. Um, just because mm -hmm. it kind of the way that the pandemic was handled, the way that the media covered it the way that doctors seem to have this authority whenever there were these very basic common sense gaps in what they were doing really mm -hmm. affected us um, and why we started this publication and why Davis decided to start it and invited me to become mm -hmm. a, a member of the team. So how has the pandemic affected you personally and affected your business? And have you seen a large increase in people interested in your services since 2020? Hmm. That's a hard question to answer because I started in 2020 what I'll, what I'll say is during the pandemic, I don't know what it is. It, we, we developed this us versus them sort of mentality as a culture in general. And that really broke my heart because I don't look at it that way. I, I, will, never, I will never say it's me versus you. Um, I partner with physicians all the time and I love them. There are some really good doctors out there. I would also say that health is not a one size fits all. So if somebody comes to me and they have something that we find on a test that's very alarming, I have a handful of people that I'm going to refer them out to because I know my scope of practice. Um, I think that the pandemic was a wake up call for a lot of us to start taking better care of ourselves because we've all noticed that the pandemic hit the United States a lot harder than it hit other places. And I think that was an awakening, like an, an eye-opening moment for people that, hey, we were already in a pandemic of sick people before the pandemic hit us. And I think it, it's inspired a lot of people to take better care of their health and to want to have labs that have a little bit more meaning. I joke and I call a basic metabolic panel a CYA lab, cover your butt lab for doctors, because it's going to pick up on really alarming things. It's not going to pick up on things that lead to disease. It's going to tell us, are you dying? Do we need to put you in the emergency room or are you coasting? Um, and that, that's not the kind of facts that people want about their health, right? They want to know what's going on under the surface. What can I do? What can I be paying attention to now to prevent 
things in the future. I always tell my clients, if you can learn to listen to your body when it whispers, you'll never have to hear it scream. And we are a society of just screaming bodies. And that's something still that, I mean, we've not really had a major discourse about those underlying health conditions that caused so much problem in the pandemic. It was put on your mask, take your shot. We're going to get through this. Everything's going to go back to normal. <laughs> so it, it's a very frustrating, frustrating thing, yeah. I think, for, for society at large, because it, it it betrays sort of the lack of care that we have for health. And we look to experts to solve problems and that's it. And we get the magic pill situation. So um, it's interesting to me because I didn't know that you had to not go through a doctor to get labs. That's kind of groundbreaking news to me. So I'm sure that's the same for a lot of our viewers. Um, what do you think is the biggest misconception about what you do? That I'm woo woo or that I'm not evidence-based or I, I think people see the term functional medicine or alternative medicine and think witchcraft. And, and I think that's an idea that's been put in people's heads from mainstream media. Um, I am completely and in, in entirely evidence-based. I do the same things that your physician does. I have a HIPAA-compliant portal. I can order regular labs uh, amongst functional labs. Um, there, is nothing, there is nothing that I do that's not rooted in evidence. But I will also say I think there's a limitation to evidence-based practice in that it doesn't it doesn't allow for nuance and it doesn't allow for individual anecdotal healing stories. And I think those are also important. So I try to pay attention to um, different clients' experiences because what works for Susan isn't going to work for Jesse, which isn't going to work for Sam, right? It's everybody's, it is a customized. And I think that's what people are attracted to right now is this individualized, customized approach to care versus a cookie cutter system. So going along with that, what's your most popular service and what's your favorite service that you offer? Uh, I My bread and butter is my one-on-one -on -one private coaching. I love, love, love my women. We My, my most popular uh, tests are the Dutch hormone test. It's a urine-based hormone test. And then um, the GI MAP test, which is a stool-based test. So um, we, we measure hormones and we measure gut. And with my one-on-one -on -one gals, we meet consistently over time because healing takes time. I don't have knowledge of results if I only see you one time. So I don't structure my sessions like a doctor's office where it's like, well, I'll see you when you don't feel well anymore or come back when, when you feel worse. It's no, 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 no. We're going to see what's going on in your body. We're going to develop a plan. And then we're going to reevaluate that plan over time because I don't think I'm going to have all the answers up front now. I don't put that I don't put that on myself to essentially play God and think that I can do that. I don't I don't think that's realistic of anybody. So it's it's a process. And as long as you're in it for the ride and I am my guarantee to everybody I work with is I will 100 percent leave you better than I found you. And I think that um, I've lived up to that. So I guess my, my, my question is like, what is, what do the guys do? I mean, I'm, I'm the kind of person that goes to the doctor for my annual physical. Um, mm -hmm. I almost cut my finger off and I was still like, I don't want to go to the emergency room, even though it was gushing blood. So, you know, I'm somebody that's concerned about my health, especially as I'm getting older. Um, what is, is there somebody in the area that can kind of provide similar services as you for all the dudes in our audience? Yeah, so I, I do work with men. Um, I would say the majority of the women I see, I end up treating their husbands <laughs> at some point, um, which is which is wonderful. Um, there are some some men in the area. I um, it, it, I guess it depends on what you're what you're dealing with. If I think you mentioned seasonal allergies at the beginning, um, there's a Vanderbilt physician, Dr. Basil Kawash, who I really really love. Um, He's not holistic. He is as traditional as they come, um, but he's curious and he's hungry for knowledge. So that's what I really like about him. And he's collaborative in his approach. Um, <clears throat> if you're looking for a general practitioner, there are some other names that I could I could throw out for you if you have like show notes or something. Um, but uh, yeah, for, for guys, I tend to look into the gut more than hormones. And gosh, what I find. <laughs> uh, but you know what? I, one thing I do want to say about these functional labs is there is no such thing as doom and gloom. 
because everything that we find in these lab results, you have agency over. You're not married to those results, okay? So if we find that you have blastocystis hominis, which is this ugly parasite, guess what? We can kill it. If you have C. diff, we can get rid of it. If you have um, really bad dysbiosis and IBS, we can solve that. So I, I, if you're listening to this and you're like, oh my gosh, I have all these things, all these problems, know that you have more power over your, over your health than anybody's ever led you to believe. And I think that was the biggest lesson I had to learn leaving traditional medicine is I was, I was stuck in this box thinking, well, these are my only options. And it's, that's just not the case. Your body was beautifully and wonderfully made and is definitely capable of healing. In fact, your body wants to achieve what's called homeostasis, which is where things are evened out. Your body wants that, it craves that. So maybe your job is to get out of the way and just let your body do its thing healing. And think about that everything you put into your body is either helping it heal or impeding it from healing. And maybe evaluate the way you live your life through that lens. So did you get a lot of pushback from some of your mm -hmm. business colleagues whenever you decided to go out on your own during the pandemic or were some of the people that you'd known in the health community, were they more supportive or how did that work yeah. out for you? <laughs> <laughs> if you are listening to this and you are thinking about owning your own business, no matter what it is, you are going to lose a bunch of friends. Um, and if you're in the healthcare space, you're going to lose a bunch more is all I'm, I'm, I have to say about that. Just, um, I wasn't prepared for that. Um, it's, it's, in, it's surprising who supports you and who just detests you. And you just have to take a deep breath, let those things go. If you believe in what you're doing, you will find your people. That definitely applies to the, the media space as well. We've had people <laughs> who kind of turn on a dime, you know, based on our, our coverage. So mm -hmm. if you could give viewers kind of three baby steps to improve <laughs> their health, what would they be? Oh, I love this question. I love this question. Okay. I'm going to share with you three things you can do that are completely free that will immediately improve your health. Thing number one, this is going to sound so simple. Take off your shoes when you come home. Your shoes track so much mold and um, bacteria and things that are really bad and almost nearly impossible to get out of your carpet if you have carpet. So just take your shoes off when you come home. And you will improve the air quality of your home simply by taking your shoes off. Um, another thing that's free that I think everybody should do is open your windows at least 30 minutes a day. Get air circulating. You take 20,000 breaths a day. And if air quality is not at the top of your list for your health, it should be because that's the thing you're consuming the most throughout the day. So make sure you have clean air. And the best way to do that is open your windows. The, the air quality outside is always, always, always going to be better than inside. Um, unless there's like a wildfire happening outside your house, which you should leave anyways. Um, so, so take off your shoes, open your windows, and then drink filtered water. Now this one might cost money if you don't have a filtration system or access to clean water, but clean water. So I live in Franklin, Tennessee, where we had a wrist slap recently because we had too much chlorine in our water. Chlorine, if you're not familiar, well, you probably associate it with swimming pools. It's a, it's a halogen on the periodic table of elements, just like fluorine. So fluoride is also unfortunately in our water. And those things compete with another halogen called iodine. You need iodine to create hormones, specifically your thyroid hormone. Who here has a thyroid problem? Pfft, all of us. So that's one thing you can do is start drinking filtered water and fluoride out of your water so that you can support your hormone production naturally. Yeah. So I'm also curious, I know, I know nasal irrigation is kind of a big thing now and there's that no, mm -hmm. fancy navage system. And um, I mean, how do you feel about that as, as, a, as a measure, you know, neti pots, um, the saltwater rinses for sinuses? Yeah. I, if you can keep those things clean, great. <laughs> Like the best thing that's I'm just this is really on my mind today because I woke up with like the worst allergy headache, so it was Aww. perfect timing that it came up. But, but we're, um, in, we're in ragweed season now. Yeah, it's yeah. it's been very, very bad for sure. Um, so why why the Metro Nashville area to sort of set up your practice? I mean, why we're a local show, we talk about Middle yeah. Tennessee a lot. So what is it about this area that you like doing business in? 
I have always loved Nashville. Um, I think something that attracts me, so Nashville is home of the largest hospital corporation in the world. Did you know that? Yeah. FCA, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so big of a company that they were actually um, considered a monopoly once and had to break off into separate companies, which is a very interesting rabbit hole for another day. I love HCA. I used to work for them. They're fantastic. I'm not, I'm not trashing. Uh, I won't ever trash anybody, but um, I think there's a challenge here because it's such a healthcare hub. I would love for functional medicine to have a stronger voice here. Now, if you're on like the West, like, well, not California, but if you're in like Oregon or Washington, it's really easy to find like naturopathic doctors and things of that nature. Out here, not so much. Out here, we have a smaller voice. And so, um, and I consider Nashville home. I, I'm not from here, but I've lived here for over a decade. And I, I want to serve the people in my community. These are my people and that's, these are the people I wanna serve. So um, that's why Nashville. So is there anything that, is a barrier to the kind of work that you do in terms of the legal process. I know when I was living in Louisiana, I had a, mm -hmm. a friend that advocated natural alternatives and was, you know, had a, had a degrees, had a doctorate, and he ended up uh, getting in trouble with the local authorities in Louisiana because of some draconian laws. So mm -hmm. yeah, is, is there anything here that could, you know, better the climate um, that legislators could do or that legislators should maybe take another look at as they're coming into the general assembly and thinking about bills for next year? that could benefit, because I know, I mean, we know that uh, Big Pharma is not exactly, uh, they don't take a back seat to the legislature, just like they don't take a back seat to donating. Medical school. <laughs> Medical school, right, 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 exactly. So, you know, we, we know our legislators are probably affected by Big Pharma, but is there anything that is currently a problem on the books or something that, you know, you would advocate your local representative or senator yeah. to address? Actually, and this doesn't affect me personally. Um, I'm pretty ironclad with my, with my setup, but I do have some friends that are nutritionists and it is, even if you are certified, it is impossible to use the term nutritionist in the state of Tennessee because the legislation protects registered dietitians. And that is really unfortunate for anybody that practices nutrition. So you'll 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 notice this now. Anybody that practices as a nutritionist is going to call themselves something else, whether that's like an unregulated term, like "Hi, I'm a nutrition practitioner," or you know something like that. Um, they'll have to go by a different title because the term nutritionist is reserved for registered dietitians, and um, that's that's really unfortunate because. Registered dietitians, just like occupational therapists and physical therapists, we are all taught under the traditional medicine umbrella. And in my experience, and this is not true, this is a generalized statement, not true of everybody. The registered dietitians that I have worked with don't tend to know a lot about nutrition. They know a, a lot about how to titrate peg tube feeds for patients in the hospital and progressing different diets, but they don't know what sulforaphane is and how that can help somebody with estrogen dominance. They don't know what that is, but our nutritionists do because they have totally different schooling. So it's, um, I, don't, I think that is unfortunate and I have hope for the future there. I also kind of wanted to just tell people that are nutritionists, hey, just call yourself something else. Nobody cares. If you can help them, they don't care what you call yourself. So maybe we can just I mean, if, I, if I'm on that vein, like, can we call occupational therapists, God, anything other than occupational therapists as the worst title for a job ever? Because nobody knows what that means. Can we call ourselves something different while we're at it? <laughs> Anyways, but yeah, so that would be if, if legislation could be a little less harsh on, on job titles, I think that would be helpful. But you know what? We are a smart generation. We are going to figure out how to help the people that need help, regardless of some of these stupid policies. Yeah, I mean, and I have heard people think an occupational therapist is a career coach before, you mm -hmm. know, some kind of the definition of like forensics as being forensic anthropology and also like speech and debate. But I mean, yeah, I can see how that could be an issue. And I know that there are a lot of, of kind of draconian, ridiculous licensing regulations in Tennessee that make things just harder for small business owners as well. So I think it's something that yeah. we really, it's, it's not fun politically. It's not something that makes headlines, but it is something that 
would probably make the lives of the average Tennesseans better if we actually got a handle on it and somebody was bold enough to go into the weeds and figure some of this stuff out for sure. Oh my gosh, if you're listening, please support a small business in Tennessee. Tennessee is very, very hard on small businesses. It is, it is, it's incredible. There is no course in any school that you could take that could teach you what you would need to know to successfully run a business in Tennessee. It is very, very challenging. Yeah, and it's, it's something we just overlook with all of these big ticket culture war issues and we just waste time on it during the regular legislative session because, I mean, it's important to people, but it doesn't grab those headlines and it doesn't doesn't seem sexy to people to deal with this kind of stuff, but it is you know incredibly what, frustrating. You know what is sexy to people? Like how good our economy would be if we all just supported small businesses. I mean, I say this in my own practice, like everybody wants to talk about hormones because that's a sexy topic, but it takes enzymes to create hormones and it takes minerals to create enzymes. So let's talk about minerals and then we can enjoy the hormones conversation. That's how I feel about small businesses in Tennessee. Like let's support the small businesses and everybody's economy will be better, which we all we all inherently know that. We just sometimes you just need to hear it again. It doesn't really really do well on X or Twitter, I guess, as well. Um, so, <laughs> how do people find you if they they're interested in your services? We've got yeah. your website up. We've been showing it during the show, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm Stephanie Center Wellness on Instagram. That's probably the best place to find me, and my website is stephaniecenterwellness.com. I'm Stephanie S T E P H A N I E. Center, C-E-N-T-E-R. And yeah, that's me. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a little bit different conversation than we usually have, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad to open up our, our show to other topics as well. And I know that our listeners got a lot out of it. So I will see you soon. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jared. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Bye. All right. Our next segment is a postmortem of the summer blockbuster season. It might not feel like it, but we are in the fall. If you want to drink your pumpkin spice latte in 90 degree weather, this is the perfect uh, weekend to do it. But this also marks the official end of the summer season. Um, we're going to talk about it during the weekly film rundown, but our first fall movies are starting to open. The film festivals where all of the Oscar bait uh, debuts are in full swing right now. So all of those serious fall movies, some of the best that are going to end up on my top 10 list, I'm sure, are about to come out. But this summer has been incredibly strange for Hollywood releases, especially. So I'm going to bring on Jay Curtis Miller, local filmmaker, to talk about some of the uh, weird trends of the summer box office. And I think we are actually going to jump over to Easter weekend and just kind of go through some of the uh, the major hits and misses of the season. So Jay, how are you doing today? Good. How are you? Doing great. And I do want to say we can officially announce that uh, MK Ultra Violence will be playing at the National Film Festival in about yeah. three weeks. So I'm sure you're excited about that. Yeah, it's uh should be a good time. So I've actually got um, at the end of this at the end of the month that same week, and I've got uh, MK Ultra Violence playing in Nashville, uh, Colorado Springs, and Atlanta. So that's pretty. That's pretty cool. Oh, awesome. So you're definitely picking up steam with the project. And I mean, I will say we, we showed some clips from the movie last time, just enough to not get you in trouble with the festival <laughs> establishment. But um, yeah. it's a really great movie. I've 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 seen it. Um, I would highly encourage you all to check out the Tennessee Shorts block at the National Film Festival. This is not the last time I will mention this. I will be uh, I will be hawking your movie until uh, the premieres in a couple of weeks. I appreciate it. So um, if you could sum up the summer blockbuster season in one word, what would that be? Uh, like a crime scene, maybe. <laughs> like, I think that would I don't count, know. Man. I feel like this postmortem feels like uh, we're kind of like in the forensic team, and we're kind of like in the um, we're kind of looking at the body and like seeing what happened. Like the the hysteria of the murder has calm down and now we're just kind of like okay so who did what and where ha did this happen <laughs> how many people were involved yeah and i mean I, I kind of feel like we're almost like having a funeral for hollywood as we know it in some way too this season um my article in the pamphleteer this week i i talk about guardians of the galaxy volume three and mission impossible and sort of the fact that we've had this almost culture war summer where sound of freedom has been pitted against everything else and one of the things that I noticed about Guardians Volume 3 and Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1, which is my least favorite title of a movie, perhaps yeah. in the history of film, is that, you know, if if people that are of a conservative persuasion were watching these movies, 
they would find a lot that appealed to them. But right. they're sort of getting caught up in the in the online culture war controversy dynamic and not really evaluating these movies on their own terms. Now, do I think Mission Impossible, and we'll talk about it a little bit, was a perfect movie? Uh, not by any means. Um, but the, you know, the ideology behind it, the values of the movie, very similar to Guardians of the Galaxy, should have appealed to people. And I mean, both of these movies did well, but they did not, I think, do what people thought they were meant to do. Um, so why don't we start off, and I know you, you, you suggested this when we were planning the show, but going back to April with the strange success of the Super Mario Brothers movie, and I don't mean that that was a film that nobody thought was going to succeed, but right. if you were to ask me what would the top two films of the year be in terms of grosses back in January, I probably would have said Barbie. I would not mm -hmm. have said Super Mario Brothers. So what are your thoughts on the Super Mario Brothers movie? I mean, like, I don't really have a lot to say. I, I didn't see it in theaters. I saw it with my uh, my nephew and my niece, like, a few uh, few months ago. And it's it's good. It's for kids. It's not really... Um, it's not really catered to my kind of sensibilities, but it's for what it is. It's really gorgeous to look at. It's funny. And it's got a decent amount of heart in it at the very end, especially like I, I felt like the ending kind of saved it from becoming just like a, like I, I've only seen like maybe the first despicable me at, from illumination. And I just kind of felt those movies were always pretty safe and bland. And this is fairly safe. I wouldn't call it bland, but I, I feel like there's a really good arc for Mario at the end of the movie that kind of justified me. I, I, I don't know, watching it. I mean, I love Mario and I love Nintendo, so I, it was kind of fun to watch, but it wasn't really, um, it, it played it fairly safe, you know, as far as just like a, a IP movie. Yeah. So. I mean, and what I liked about it too was that it didn't really feel like they were trying to promote it as a franchise. I mean, they had the they had the post credit sequence, but it seemed to be a very contained story, and it wasn't trying to like set up Mario as the next big thing. But my question is, you know, Barbie film fans knew it was going to be an interesting movie because Greta Gerwig was directing it, and I don't right. want to talk too much about Barbie and Oppenheimer because we've done that to death on the show, and everybody has, and we know they're great. Yeah. But you know, I, I knew that movie was going to make a lot of money. Margot Robbie famously said that it was a billion dollar movie, but why do you think Super Mario Brothers made over half a billion dollars at the domestic box office? I mean, this movie's huge. Right. Um, I think it's just, uh, obviously, kids, I don't know, Mario's really popular with kids of, like, any generation. Going back to, like, I think he first was, like, created and released into a video game in 1985, I think. And ever since then, it's just he's been able to spawn multiple generations from Gen Xers, Millennials, and Gen Z to play Mario games. Uh, you have that. The animation really is gorgeous. Like, it's colorful to look at. It's beating Pixar to death. I haven't seen a Pixar movie since Toy Story 4. And from what I've seen, and the very few, like, I really haven't been paying attention, but from what I've seen in the past few trailers, the animation just uh, looks the same. And, and with Mario, it's just really colorful, powerful, and fun. Um, and just, like, I do think, to some extent, Chris Pratt is a bankable star, but it just depends on the, on the movie. And I think people m may have wanted to see it out of curiosity. And then you have, like, people... Uh, who played these games in like the 80s that probably also saw it out of curiosity. So I don't know. I, I really do think mainly just the kids went to see this one. It was just a good excuse to like um, spend Easter weekend, you know, taking your all of your kids and your kids' friends and all of them just packing them up in a van and seeing this movie. So... Yeah. And I mean, I feel like it, it wasn't a movie that was, you know, trying to cater to an agenda or anything like that. It just it told its story. It knew its story. And kind of the secret weapons for me were Charlie Day's Luigi was amazing. I mean, I just I mm -hmm. love the voice. And then yeah. the existential Kirby that was just kind of. In the, yeah. yeah, it was Kirby. Right. I, was, I'm not um, as, I don't know. I see. It's already kind of like I'm already starting to forget a little bit of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, definitely not, not not Toy Story level here, but it was a great time at the movies. 
Yeah, I um actually remember seeing John Wick four for the second time that when the weekend that this came out because I think John Wick four was the weekend before this, and the, the theater was packed and I hadn't seen it that packed in maybe since Spider Man No Way Home maybe. And I was like, oh, that movie's making a billion dollars. And it was like just Saturday. And there's just like lines of just kids just waiting to see this movie. So, which is great. I mean, I think preserving that theatrical experience for kids is also something that, you know, the communal aspect of movies. So, speaking of Chris Pratt, um, you know, Guardians 3 is kind of the unsung hero of the Marvel universe because it did what it was supposed to do in terms of box office like it it grossed around the same as the pre-pandemic guardians entries um mm -hmm. i thought it was a really interesting movie myself just because of the fact that it really is a movie that treats bureaucracy and people claiming to do something for the greater good as the villains of the film i mean social right. engineers are the thanos i mean marvel kind of has a track record of doing that but that's what i talk about a lot about in my my essay this week in the pamphleteer. So what were your thoughts about the new guardians? Well, I, I still haven't seen this one yet. And I, I probably am a product of like, not really caring about MCU anymore or the MCU. Um, I don't, yeah, I guess I just missed this one and I heard great things, but there's just something about like, um, I guess just supporting Marvel at this point where I'm a little bit more hesitant these days. Um, not just because of the all the political discourse, and w you can talk about that to death, but just the blatant, like, at this point, it's a conveyor belt of just making a soulless product and just churning it out and just expecting people to, like, come and see it. I mean, this came out after Ant-Man 3, and that was a gigantic bomb at the box office. And I, I, I know this is good because James Gunn is a good filmmaker, but I... And reading your review, I'm more interested in seeing it now. But I think I was just in a lull of, man, I don't want to really sit there <laughs> like a Marvel picture at the moment. So, yeah. And I mean, to, to be fair, like one of the reasons that it took me so long to publish this review, I wanted to do something toward the end of the box office season. But after seeing Ant-Man, like I saw this movie July 4th weekend when it had like one showtime left because as much as I like Marvel and I was somebody that went opening night to most of these movies, I've, I've got that fatigue too. And it's just, it's mm -hmm. because of the fact that it's the TV series, everything about Marvel is, is branding and the quality that really made it something compelling with Iron Man and Captain America and Robert Downey Jr. And Chris Evans has just kind of gone away at this point. Um, which right. Is frustrating. I mean, I feel like guardians guardians is the exception to the rule, but I don't have a lot of high hopes for the future of Marvel unless there's somehow able to bring back Robert Downey Jr. and Chris Evans and get back to basics. Um, I feel like yeah. this is almost Marvel swan song in some ways. I mean, I liked Wakanda forever, but that movie is always going to have an asterisk next to it. I mean, they did what they could with that one and made a really compelling film, but that Ant-Man movie, and there was no reason it shouldn't have been better. There was no reason at right. all. Um, yeah. So kind of the first miss of the summer, and I will say like, I wanted to see Fast X. I've only seen like half of them, but just to kind of, you know, complete... <laughs> Complete sure. my summer movie going experience. Um, but it was out of theaters before I had a chance to see it, which was shocking to me. I mean, the previous entry in 2000 or 2021 made more money during the pandemic when people were still afraid to go out. So this was kind of the first casualty of the summer. So why do you think that was with Fast 10? And this is Fast 10 part one or Fast 10 part one of three or something. <laughs> That's the exact reason probably why it didn't do well. It's, it's called... Fast X, which it's Fast and Furious 10, part one of three. <laughs> like, uh, I don't know. I, I, I know there's an audience for this. Uh, and these movies wouldn't be outright bombs if they didn't spend so much money. But I can't completely blame um, the budget for some of these post-pandemic movies because they were made during the pandemic and that just doubled your budget. It went, every time you um, every time you reschedule anything, it, it's astronomical how much cost that is. Like your equipment rentals are doubled, your location rentals are doubled. Like paying all of your crew out uh, if they're on salary, you're paying them for weeks that they're not working. Uh, so yeah, it's gonna it's gonna blow up. So um, I didn't 
I've only I think I've only seen I don't even know what they're called. Furious six <laughs> and seven. I think I've only seen those two. I know that Fast Five. I've heard it that that's really good. Uh, but for me, this is just too outlandish for me to kind of unlike uh, Mission Impossible, where they kind of keep getting better. I, I it's just too outlandish for me to kind of enjoy. I guess. So and one I of don't the. Know. One of the striking things for me this summer, one of my best movie going experiences was at the Clarence Brown Film Festival um, that happened in Knoxville about three weeks ago. And a lot of that festival was restored silent films. And there was mm -hmm. one um, called The Signal Tower that was about a train operator and there was a train crash and it was made in the mid 20s. Mm -hmm. And just marveling at the fact that these directors actually had to figure out a way to orchestrate this and build tension without any right. of the CGI, um, you know, there was that train sequence in Mission Impossible, which is pretty impressive, but that movie from 1924, like it gripped me more than any of the CGI spectacle and even the nods oh, to yeah. practical effects that Mission Impossible does, which was very striking to me. I mean, I think people are getting very tired of just this rote, not to not to attack v VFX artists, but we gotta be honest that VFX have not really evolved in any meaningful way since Terminator 2 and Jurassic Park. It's just not. Right not the case i mean it's it's only gotten worse if you even go back and watch those movies they still look better than they look better than avatar they look better than anything that's come yeah. out mm -hmm. um the little mermaid was probably one of the the break-even success stories it did very well uh during memorial day weekend here in the united states but there were a lot of other countries that it just completely bombed in and the the reason was racism um i don't know if you saw this one or not but <laughs> i did it was utterly serviceable um okay. i've completely forgotten about it um right I'm, i've not really felt like a lot i really like the dumbo live action the tim burton one i thought was a really just dark interesting movie and okay i'm a big fan of kenneth branagh's cinderella but i just can't bring myself to care about any of these live action disney movies as anything but a cash grab i don't know what your feelings are about that I don't think I've seen a single one. Uh, maybe I've seen clips of Aladdin on the TV uh, when my nephew was watching it. Uh, and then I, that was more reason for me to just not <laughs> check out any of the rest of them. I, I had an interest maybe in seeing Beauty and the Beast. Uh, I don't know who directed that. Did Kenneth Branagh also do it? That one was that Bill one? Condon who did Kenzie oh, okay. in the Twilight movies and Gods and Monsters, which is a phenomenal film. But Gotcha. Okay. Um, I have like a connection to Beauty and the Beast because I was in the musical when I was in high school, and I and I think that I think Beauty and the Beast is one of my favorite uh, animated films, but also just Disney movies in general. That I love that movie, and I I had an interest to see that, but at the same time, it just looked way too overly spectacle, where it's not really special anymore. It's just it's just live action doing the same shot that is better in the animated movie because it's animated and it was designed to be animated when you do it in live action it just feels oddly like inhuman like in like not human in a way like i don't know if that makes sense but this just looks lifeless <laughs> you know yeah, it, it really does one of the best discussions i have with my intro to film students is showing clips of the lion king remake and asking is this really live action you know, right <laughs> I mean, you've got actors, you've got, I don't know exactly how much of this works in terms, but you just look at these clips of The Little Mermaid and none of this is done on a set. None of this really has any heart to it. Right. And you know, the original Little Mermaid, the original Beauty and the Beast, and I don't want to sound like an old cranky person, but I just, visually, I'm not interested in these movies. Um, yeah. the, the scripts are serviceable. It seems like the only real reason for them to exist is to like make correctives to things that were acceptable in the past and aren't anymore. So I don't understand yeah. the reasoning besides the money coming in and people just throwing their dollars down, which seems to be changing a little bit too. Yeah. We'll see how, um, I think Snow White will be kind of like the ultimate say in which direction they go. Cause that looks like it's going to really bomb at the box office. Just how, just the online discourse, even if you're, conservative or a liberal most people think uh what's her name uh is it rachel ziegler or is that her yeah i'm okay yeah uh I, most people think she's detestable <laughs> yeah and I, I i i don't understand there's just there's this onslaught of actors that hollywood is just saying like these are the next stars and one thing that outside of poor harrison ford has been proven this summer movie season is that 
Denzel Washington is a movie star. Tom Cruise right. is still a movie star. No matter how much you push these people on us, in three years, they're going to be in Cocaine Bear 9. And that's right. going to be their careers. I mean, they're they're not ready for prom time. They don't have the same level of expertise as even somebody like a Jennifer Lawrence, which we'll get to in a second. Yeah. Uh, uh, years ago, I don't know if you watch uh, Red Letter Media or their show Half the Bag online, uh, but when they reviewed Creed, one of the guys on there was stating like, it's so weird watching uh, Sylvester Stallone act with Michael B. Jordan because Sylvester Stallone just... There's something about like the actors from the 70s era and how much charisma they have compared to the millennials now. And like it is like it's so apparent even like, um, you know, with Harrison Ford and Phoebe Waller-Bridge, there's just such a divine line of like star power and whatever that is. <laughs> I think that's that's just great. I mean, that, that's somebody that I think and we've had a lot of discourse about this on Twitter, just someone that is really forced down your throat, who is yeah. now ruined the Bond franchise, the Star Wars franchise with Solo and Indiana Jones is probably the biggest massacre of her entire career because right. I don't see how that recovers. Like we would have been better off with Shia LaBeouf as Indiana Jones in many ways. So, yeah. Um. One of the movies that was the big surprise for me of the summer, which I don't know why it didn't do better, was The Machine with Burt Kreischer. Did you happen to see this one? I I think that was in the box office for like a day. <laughs> it I, was. I don't think I even had time. Um, but still, I'm not sure if I would have seen that because I'm not a huge Burt Kreischer fan in general. Yeah. Uh, but how was it? And I, I wasn't either. Like, I'd seen some of his bits. Um, and then uh, Johnny Tatro, who was also in theater camp, it plays the younger version of him. This is, it's like Pineapple Express to me. Like, it's that kind of comedy that's really not made anymore. Um, mm -hmm. Two really great examples of this are The Machine and Bottoms from this summer. And I feel like both of those should have been, you know, maybe Bottoms might have a more, uh, an audience that has a little bit less broad appeal. But I was just, I was frustrated this movie did as badly as it did because it's, it's hilarious. It's inventive. Um, yeah. it's, it's very, very sort of like mocking and self-deprecating about his persona in general as this kind of oafish guy. Okay. And the action scenes are really well directed. So I, okay. I would recommend when this is out on streaming that anybody take a look at it. I mean, I don't think it's something that I could pontificate about intellectually in an essay for the pamphleteer, but I enjoyed the hell out of it for okay. sure. Um, you know, a couple of other movies that I wanted to talk about, and I've talked about a little bit, you know, we talked about Transformers on the show in my discussion of the writer's strike. Um, mm -hmm. I also, you know, want to mention that Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse was another one of these $300 million grossing movies that yeah. it seems like everybody saw and was really solid, really beautiful, but it's not really been talked about that much at all this summer. So, you know, even though it did so well, why do you think that it almost has like a 97% audience score and critic score on Rotten Tomatoes, but I don't hear anybody like talking about it in the same way as Barbie and Oppenheimer, even though plenty of people saw it. So do you have any, any insights on that? Uh, I, I'm not sure that, cause that's, um, that's interesting. I did see this and I, I quite enjoyed it. Um, and a lot of people didn't like the cliffhanger aspect. I love a good cliffhanger, especially if it's like, um, kind of like a two parter. I'm for some reason, if it's done pretty well, which I think it, did do pretty well in this. I, I mean, it makes me want to see the next one, uh, but I don't know. I think, I mean, I think you're kind of like kidding to yourself if you don't think that there is any sort of superhero fatigue. Like, I feel like people are trying to say that there isn't one. I mean, if this did fairly well and it was like kind of like the talk of the town for the few weeks that I was out um, or like, when it first came out and everybody was talking about it. Um, yeah. I don't know. Like, I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. And I mean, you compare that to a movie like the flash mentioning superhero fatigue that, <laughs> right. I mean, that was one of the ones that I saw pretty early in its run. And as much as I love seeing Michael Keaton as Batman again, I mean, I, I know we've had this discussion of the flash as like, you see it as like a Michael Cimino Heaven's Gate level disaster for yeah. Hollywood. So do you want to talk about that theory of yours a little bit? Sure. Well, there's a, a difference between uh, the disaster of Heaven's Gate, which I just read uh, the latest, the new, um, the only, auto, uh, bi sorry, 
the only bi- biography on Michael Cimino called Cimino. I just finished it this week. Um, so I've been really heavy into that whole kind of like um, historical aspect of Heaven's Gate. But the difference between Heaven's Gate failing and the Flash failing is no heads are going to roll from the Flash. That's the kind of cultural difference, I feel like. Like, any Muschietti is going to have a career after this. Like, he's going to, like, I mean, he's, like, contracted to kind of defend this disaster of a movie. But, like, Michael Cimino, he did, I mean, he had a career after it, but it wasn't really lustrous. He didn't really have, like, a second chance to really prove himself of who he, um, of his talent as a director. And he was completely maligned by everybody in Hollywood, and it still is to this day. Um, but I don't know. Like, I, it's, it really is like watching the Hindenburg in, like, uh, in real time. Like, I, when I saw it, and I've kind of come back around to it, I kind of, like, had it on Max, like, a few nights ago, just, like, revisiting some of the scenes. And it's not that bad. Uh, it's, it, it's literally just, like, they pulled it, they pulled the plug on it, on it and it wasn't finished. And they were like, we can't spend any more money on this. It's going to be released. We'll take whatever financial loss from it. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's more interesting to revisit um, than Dial of Destiny is to me. Like, I think this is more of a fascinating failure than Indiana Jones 5 because this should have worked. like this should have worked. I didn't think it was going to fail that that horribly at the box office. Like I knew, I don't I don't know if I thought it was going to reach a billion, but I certainly north to eight hundred million. You know, and and, it, and so. it's also a good example too of what happens whenever you put these actors who have a lot of gravitas, like Ben Affleck and Michael Keaton, against someone like Ezra Miller, who. Injustice League was great for quips and one-liners against all of yeah. these other actors, but it shows such a danger of turning these people into stars before they've earned it. I mean, we we can compare this to some of the you know really great millennial actors like Kristen Stewart, Robert Pattinson, and Batman, who kind of earned his place and and developed his craft before yeah. he took on a role like this. And audiences responded much better to that movie because he was ready at that point in his career to yeah have that gravitas as opposed to Esme Miller, who he clicks these boxes. He shows our diversity quotient. We're going to throw him to the wolves. I mean, we're seeing the same thing with Marvel with Jonathan majors, who I do think is a major acting talent. I but, do too. I mean, he was somebody that was thrown into this multi-part deal and turned into a celebrity before maybe he was ready for it as well. So this is something right. like the combination of these marketed stars and the franchises might be proving to be a disaster. Mm -hmm. Um, I do want to talk about Elemental and Indiana Jones since you mentioned it, because these were the two movies that famously lost $900 million for Disney this year, along yeah. with Ant-Man and the Wasp. Um, both of these movies premiered at the Cannes Film Festival in May, which, you know, is the major event of the year for film. It's going to launch all the international Oscar contenders. And it backfired completely showing this. I mean, they, they were hoping for a Mad Max Fury Road effect where the screening was going to be stunning for both of these movies. And both of them did very badly at the box office. Neither has crossed 200 million at a time when the last Indiana Jones made 400 million and Toy Story, all the Toy Story movies have made 300 to 400 million as well. So yeah. do you think audiences are just tired of the Disney aesthetic or do you think that there's something more going on here as to the failure of these two films in particular? Um, with Elemental, which I haven't seen, but by just by looking at this, the animation to, and we're watching this on like a live stream. So it's compressed a little, but even when you're playing the Mario brothers trailer, that those the animation on that looks so much better than this. Um, I think there is a DeSantis effect, especially on the Pixar and like the Disney children um, kind of like, um, like, aspect to that i think like some parents are just like not taking their kids to see disney anymore and which is fair i guess like depending on where you lean but um i think there is like an effect from the florida all that sort of stuff i mean i mean we've already kind of talked about indiana jones but i mean that just it's a movie that should not have been made like just as simple as that and definitely should not have cost that much to make uh it's insane to me like 
just how astronomically big that budget was. And again, that was shot during COVID and um, Harrison Ford, I think he broke his shoulder or he threw it out or something like the first one of the first days of shooting, which pivots your scheduling and all that sort of stuff. But I do think there is just a general like lack of quality coming from Disney. I don't think there's been a movie that's come out that's original that has really, I don't know, entered the zeitgeist in a way. Cause it's all been IP since like, like 2012, you know? I mean, you have like Frozen and Encanto, but even those, I mean, Encanto did horribly at the box office and kind of only mm -hmm. found its footing because people were still afraid to go to the movies. And Elemental and Indiana Jones are kind of the big bombs in The Flash. But we also have to look later in the summer to the movies that you know nobody really saw because all of these still made over $100 million. But we have Blue Beetle that came out three weeks ago that is just, <laughs> no one is concerned. Nobody cares about Blue Beetle. No. Um, I mean, despite my massive lifelong crush on Susan Sarandon, I still haven't seen this movie. Um, I haven't either. Uh, and then The Haunted Mansion, which was another movie that literally no one saw. I mean, it made 60 million. It's made less money than the Eddie Murphy version did in 2003, not adjusted for inflation. So yeah. both of these were films that were just complete and utter disasters. Um, but we did have some bright spots to the summer. And one of them, I think, was No Hard Feelings with Jennifer Lawrence, um, mm -hmm. which was a gross-out comedy that made about $50 million. It was a movie that really did show. And I'm, I'm not a, a fan of Jennifer Lawrence personally. I find her very grating in interviews. Um, sure. I can't deny that she is ridiculously talented. Um, yeah. And, you know, to me, the fact that she made this movie and she has that hilarious nude scene that everybody's talking about. Um, right. I just, what I couldn't figure out about this movie is why that didn't translate into like the water cooler talk that one would think a movie like this might have. I mean, this is a movie in the vein of Knocked Up. It's not nearly as well written, but it still works. The screenplay yeah. is serviceable. Um, I would watch it again. You know, it's not a movie that I would, you know, keep in my comedy pantheon or anything, but why do you feel this one did well, but it didn't really break out in the way that it maybe should have? Um, I feel like it would have, probably done well 10 years ago like um because that was kind of like the end of the whole like gross out comedy like judd apatow era at when he was at his height i think um i don't know maybe we're like just as a general movie going audience like people are have been like like i don't know how to say this but like programmed to just not see comedies anymore like just to go out and see a comedy i don't know what that says about our culture like um but i don't know like i just don't think uh we get a, enough comedies these days and i don't think like a, get enough good ones that are worth seeing but in general like there's just not much i don't know like i can't remember the last time i went to see a comedy in theaters but i kind of consider barbie one which I felt like was kind of a return to like big budget comedy. I mean, there's more going on in Barbie, but I do feel like that it's considered kind of generically speaking a comedy or broadly speaking. And one of the interesting things that happened is like the teen movies that were so popular in the nineties sort of morphed in the early two thousands. And especially after the recession into the hunger games and Harry Potter and twilight. So yeah. I mean, do you think there's a way forward for like the studio comedy of getting butts in the seats again? Or do you think that Barbie is going to be the future of comedy where it's these high concept, massive blockbuster properties? I hope, I hope it's not that. <laughs> I, I don't yeah. think any, <laughs> I don't, I really don't know. Um, I, I think what it might have to take is for kind like, so i mean this is kind of like connected but um the trailer for thanksgiving came out yesterday i think for eli roth's new I, I guess horror movie but it might be comedy but tim dylan is in that and i hope like i hope that does well and i hope like he just gets he is primed to make a comedy right now like just a guts out dumb and dumber tommy boy-esque comedy where it's just ruthless it's funny he does he says whatever he wants like It'd have to take someone like of his stature of that kind of like, um, I guess like post Joe Rogan era of like comedians. But then again, like the machine didn't do well. So 
I don't know. It's tricky. Yeah, I mean, and, and it, I think that movie, that's really the one, outside of The Exorcist, that's the one I'm really looking forward to this fall, aside from some of the the Oscar-type movies and the serious cinema that's coming out from some of our, our, our great auteur directors. But, yeah. um, you know, maybe maybe the fact that it is horror will, will kind of push that and the fact that it is a holiday movie. I mean, Eli Roth is one of my favorite directors. I think he's a really underrated presence in the film scene. Right. Um, you know, we did have toward the end of the summer, even after Barbie and Oppenheimer, a few movies that did really well. So, I mean, you know, Ninja Turtles was a franchise that should have been exhausted, but still drew an audience. The Meg, mm -hmm. even though that it was kind of a, uh, a step down in quality, if that's possible from the first one, which I love as a guilty pleasure. And yeah. then Equalizer 3 is doing great numbers. Um, okay. All three of these are, why do you think? If we were trying to chart, say people are sick of sequels, people are sick of reboots, people are sick of all of these things. What do you think it was about those three movies that defied conventional wisdom? I can't speak for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles because, again, it's kind of the child, uh, early teens demographic. And that's really hard to kind of figure out. Um, I will say that for that, though, going with like, uh, across the universe they have similar kind of animation styles which is interesting i feel like we're kind of moving away from cgi a little bit and going back a little bit more to like hand-drawn aesthetic that's kind of more experimental which is good but for meg too i think it's kind of a meme to see which kind of helps these these movies like make money um and it's just kind of ridiculous to see what is it he's He's on a jet ski with the samurai sword and he's like got his foot to the to the shark's mouth or something. He's I, I don't know what he's doing, but uh, there's a meme aspect to that where it's like so stupid. There's like no agenda to it. And Denzel Washington, like it's everybody likes him like he I, he just like he's one of the best actors of our time. It's crazy to me that he's 70 like he doesn't look 70 at all, um, which is good. So. I mean, like, it seems to me like um, those these three movies just don't have, like, a mean aspect to them or their audience, I guess. Like, looking down upon them, I think they're just kind of, like, happy to exist in the theater. Just come have a good time for, like, 90 minutes. That's what it seems geared towards to me. So. Yeah. And, I mean, Denzel still has a lot of power. When I was living in Kentucky, there was a woman and her group of friends that – no matter what Denzel Washington movie came out, like if it was Flight, if it was Roman J. Israel Esquire, if it was The Equalizer 2 or The Equalizer, they would be yeah. first in line on Friday and they would go up to the ticket counter and just say one for Denzel, please. <laughs> and that's what they yeah. would do. So, I mean, he's he's one of the few celebrities, but he's also because, you know, he's he doesn't really dumb himself down. He doesn't patronize people. He just does his work and goes yeah. on. And I think that's something probably why his son has actually become also very popular, John David Washington. Um, yeah. He, he learned from the best. You know, Denzel Washington was always quoted that advice that Sidney Poitier gave him about if they see you all the time on every talk show, like you're the rock, they're not going to pay to see you on the weekends. So you have to have right. that level of mystique about you. Uh, a little yeah. Bit. So top three films of the summer that you saw. It's good. I mean, it's going to be obvious, but it's, Oppenheimer, I've seen that three times. I kind of said goodbye to it last Friday in 70 millimeter. I was just kind of, I wanted to soak it up one more time. Uh, there's just something about seeing a movie in, on film that's a magical experiment uh, experience that I that not my, many people anymore just understand. Um, but that for sure, Barbie's up there. Um, and I would have to maybe go with across the universe or across the spider verse um just because that was like uh, I, I i'm pretty superhero fatigued out too but th to me that story at least had legs and was interesting and like there's real stakes to that character miles morales especially at the very end that could upend his entire life so like anytime a character is like actually kind of goes through like hardship which is that doesn't happen anymore really in movies it's usually like they're good at everything and they win and that's it like for miles morales he was really put through the ringer in that movie um so i would say top three 
I don't know if the old boy restoration counts, but that might be up there too because that was the first time I experienced that. Yeah, so. that was that was a magic. I mean, it's a grotesquely magical evening, I should say. But yeah, um, I'm really glad that I saw it, and it was packed yeah. too. I mean, that movie's made two million dollars. I didn't put it on the list, but right because um, it was kind of in that August frame. I mean, mine would be Asteroid City, Barbie, and Oppenheimer. Um, I okay. think those are probably going to be in the top five of the year. And yeah. I think Spider Verse and the Machine, honestly, are going to be down there for me. Um, you know, pretty mm -hmm. close. Probably will not be on my best of the year list, but sure. Uh, you know, I, I guess we'll see. What about your biggest disappointment? It's it has to be. I mean, probably Mission Impossible: Dead Reckoning. And I, it's weird for me to say that, but like, um. It has like all the ingredients, but it just doesn't mix together. And I don't when when I first saw it, the opening twenty minutes, I was really nervous. <laughs> like it, it was just so exposition heavy. I don't feel like the editing had a rhythm to it. Uh, I don't. And like, there's just so many like uh, lines from just CIA ops that are just giving me the the plot of the movie and there's no mystique to it uh it got it got better as it went along but i was really nervous going in and i didn't feel that way with fallout fallout was like kind of gave me whiplash so i was like oh it's an oh I'm, i've been a fan of the mission impossible movies but like this one with when i saw fallout i was like oh i'll see it and then i was like completely blown away i was like whoa that was actually another level of like sophistication that these movies haven't seen yet. And I, I was just expecting the exact same thing. And I don't think we got it. Uh, there's a lot of question, questionable, like dialogue scenes and just like lines that are just like, why this, it feels, it felt very like first draft to me. Um, and I, I don't know, like, it's still like, I, I think I've seen it twice. Um, and I, I plan to re, like revisit again when I get it on Blu-ray, but it just didn't have that kinetic energy that the that Fallout did, and I in Top Gun Maverick as well. So, uh, but I wouldn't say it was a complete letdown. Um, it, it just a little bit disappointing because there's a lot to like in this movie. Um, there's just some story issues that uh, didn't hold up from previous installments. So. Yeah, and I mean, I, I talk about this in my review. I think one of the big issues is it's, it tries to have these big Marvel emotional moments, but you know, Ethan Hunt is Ethan Hunt, and these characters, yeah. it's, it's not the Fast and the Furious family. It's not the Marvel Universe, and that didn't work for me. Um, I got really bored by the the finale with, like, I mean, how many more trains can we go through? Jeez. <laughs> Especially right. after seeing the, the silent movie the week after. Um, I did appreciate, like, the, the AI aspect and the way that it sort of talks about the deep state and the government and I think yeah. it's definitely a movie that I enjoyed seeing in theaters. But like you said, um, John Wick had 24, I think, COVID-related people, people involved on crew. This movie okay. had a massive amount, too, and famously went over budget because it was one of the first ones back. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that that's another just sign of, like, the Hollywood excess really caving in is that they've given into this COVID paranoia, and now these are going to be permanent positions, even whenever we're seeing the virus recede or turn into something that's just endemic. Right. Um, another sign of like Hollywood bloat and excess. So yeah, real quick, uh, uh, you did talk about the deep state. There was a really weird based moment from Carrie Elway's character that I was not kind of expecting. Yeah. I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> I really want to get a beer with uh, Christopher McQuarrie and kind of like dig in more there. That, <laughs> that was, was my really... favorite scene in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. And he was, he was, he was definitely overacting, but I appreciate Carrie Elway's and how he was chewing up those lions. Like he could, I, you could tell he was kind of having fun there. Yeah. Did so. you ever see the crush with Alicia Silverstone? Like back in the day? I think like, I've heard of it. I need to see it. It's yeah, been on my list. You got to see it. It's just, it's, it's this really tawdry movie where he's this uh, journalist and Alicia Silverstone is like this high school girl that's crushing on him. And it's one of those like nice nineties, you know, like, erotic thriller things but it's one of his best performances maybe like only rivaled by this moment in this mission impossible movie sure um for me my my biggest disappointment was a24's talk to me which okay. was a movie that stylistically i thought really worked but it just failed at the world world building um okay you know, it didn't take those cues like scream nightmare on elm street 
uh, it had a really interesting concept that it didn't explore. And I mean, I think we talked about this. It seemed like a, a direct to video Bloomhouse movie that was just a little better directed oh. than some of its worst. Um, you know, this is not The Exorcist or Halloween or that like get out high quality level of Bloomhouse. Sure. And it just begged for more stories. So I was, I kind of walked out of this really ambivalent and not liking it at all. It might have hurt that I saw Oppenheimer in 70 millimeter right before, but, oh, yeah. um, you know, still, I just, it did not work for me. And I've heard a lot of people say this, and I did want to mention that because this is now A24's highest grossing horror movie somehow in the middle of, even though it was released a week after Barbie, like it's done very well with audiences. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's, I think a really great summer postmortem. Um, I know you said you wanted to stick around for the, the weekly film rundown. So are you excited sure. for The Nun 2? No. <laughs> uh, I've, I, I've seen the first Nun. I was like on a date and it was the most boring thing I've ever seen. And I can't, and it's like making a sequel to the most boring horror movie I've ever seen. So I'm not going to, I am not going to check that out. <laughs> yeah. And this is our big release this week. I mean, I'm probably going to check it out because of the fact that it's, you know, I at least want it to be fall. You know, I want to get my, my Halloween decoration out, but it's it's yeah. another one of these the conjuring multiverse. Why do we need a conjuring multiverse? Why don't we just have a really great horror movie and then a director makes another really great horror movie? Um, well, um, real quick, and this was part of the it was kind of part of the summer release season, but it was just dumped on VOD. I haven't seen it yet. I almost did. I turned it on, but it, it said like Halloween twenty twenty three, and I was like. I'm pausing this right now and I'm watching this in October because I'm not going to watch this in the middle of summer, but cobweb I've heard is really great, which is, yeah. it's kind of depressing to see something like as generic and bland and forgettable as the nun too. Um, I mean, I haven't seen it, but I'm pretty confident with that statement and something like cobweb, which is, making the rounds on like film Twitter as like something that's really, really good at, in terms of like barbarian, which kind of like was one of my favorite movies of last year. Um, so it's just kind of, I don't know, like take a chance and release that movie. Like there's a thing called a sleeper hit. Like it's not going to, if it doesn't, if it's a good movie and it doesn't do on its first um, weekend, it could potentially depending on the schedule, you know, make more money and be a hit. So yeah, and the stoop they, they released it the same week Lionsgate did, which I mean I'm I'm personally pissed off about because I have stock in that company that is just oh, okay. me right now. But they released Cobweb the same day as Barbie and Oppenheimer. Like, what did they think was going to happen? And the reviews yeah. have been great. I've heard people talking about it. I've not gotten a chance to see it yet, but it's 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 frustrating when something like that comes out, and then we've got a weekend like this one where the two big releases are The Nun Two and My Big Fat Greek Wedding Three, which. I heard you pre-order tickets for back in June, right? Like you're just <laughs> I didn't ready even know to see a, my big fat Greek wedding three. I didn't even know there's a my big fat Greek wedding two. I like I, that's news to me. I, I'm I didn't even know this movie existed until last night when I looked at the uh, lineup. I was like, okay, but again, like I don't know. I, I think. Um, I don't know what the numbers were on uh, Barbarian last year, but I know that it. I mean, it was a hit, obviously. Um, can't remember his name, but uh, the director of that got a really big payday with his upcoming feature. So exactly. clearly, yeah, um, clearly that was lucrative. And I think, I don't know, if you have like an original movie like that, that can play to, that can tap into like, not just like horror fans, but uh, general movie going uh, audiences, like it can be a hit. So I'd, I if you release that this weekend instead of and along with these, I'm pretty sure it would do decent. Yeah, and this is the so. weekend Barbarian came out last year and really surprised people. And then yeah. right after that, we had Pearl, which is another amazing horror movie last year. Right. Um, you know, my my picks this week are very slim just because of the fact that these are our wide releases. Um, the movie I'm really excited to see. I mean, I'm I'm not excited to see it. I know it's going to be just like a slog, but it's going to be a brilliant piece of art. Is the Eternal Memory, which is a documentary playing at the Bell Court. Um, it's about a Chilean cultural commentator who is suffering from Alzheimer's. It's a documentary, and it just looks like it's going to be a really brilliant movie about something people don't want to talk about and want to deny. But right. in terms of the Bell Court, you know, as, as, as much gruff as we give them sometimes for some of these pandering movies they release, 
Sure. I'm really excited also to see that they're going to be spending the next two months revisiting William Friedkin's films. Um, yes. Starting with Sorcerer this week, Cruising, yes. which is one of my favorite movies of all time. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've got The Exorcist coming up. I mean, are there any other ones in this that you're planning on seeing? Uh, the only one that I haven't seen is Bug. So, I'll, I mean, I'm probably going to go to all of those. Uh, I rewatched uh, Sorcerer, French Connection, and Cruising recently um, since his passing. Sorcerer is, is the OG Mission Impossible. Like, <laughs> if you want to talk about ha being on the edge of your seat, it's one of the most insane stunts. I, I Maybe ever, like, it's not really, you, you don't think of it as a stunt because it's just this massive truck trying to get over this wood right there, that wooden rickety bridge over a, in a storm on, um, over a river, but it's, it's tense and it happens twice. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, William Friedkin, he's a big influence on me. Uh, he's one of my favorite uh, filmmakers, not just from his films, but from his personality. He um, was kind of a rock and tour, provocative, uh, He's very pro provocative and extremely opinionated, which is like, you know, we don't really get individuals like that anymore that are really opinionated about uh, their art or other people's art or what they think is bad or good. Uh, and if you disagree with William Friedkin, he'd be like, okay, sure. Like he wasn't like really, you're, he'd probably be like, you're wrong. But like, I don't know, we need to kind of return to that sort of opinionated um, filmmaker that I think is, which might be kind of like why so many of these movies feel so bland and forgettable and just factory made anymore. Cause they're not made with kind of a style or heart to them, you know? Yeah. And you look at a movie like the French connection, or you look at a movie like cruising that is about these issues that everybody claims to be concerned about today, like LGBTQ identity and racism. And yeah. he's, he's handling these issues in ways that aren't just like preaching to the choir. Like he's really grappling with them and he's pissing people off, but he's also doing so in this compelling narrative. And no one does that anymore. Right. And we, we act like now all of a sudden, this is the first time we're dealing with these issues in cinema. And so I hope that this retrospective of Freakin's work really proves how bad in general filmmaking is these days and why. Um, right. The other, the other major, which I'm also happy to see, tribute that the Bell Court is doing is the tribute to Paul Rubens, a.k.a. Pee Wee Herman. I was advised mm -hmm. by my wife not to make a joke about going to the bathroom in the middle okay. of uh, any of these films, um, sure. but I just did anyway. So. Yeah. Um, what really struck me, though, is I was reading more about Paul Rubens for the rundown this week, and you know he's, he's got a pretty sketchy past. And I mean, I'm not going to begrudge an artist for that, but it's strange to me that you would never see in you know the next 10 years when Woody Allen and Roman Polanski died, despite how seminal of filmmakers that they were. I mean, you know, Paul Rubens in his own way for children's television, Pee Wee Herman was that level of shot to the system. But yeah. I don't expect to see many Roman Polanski and Woody Allen retrospectives coming up. So why do you think Paul Rubens gets that pass given his sort of sketchy history with, um, you know, some what some would say is sexual deviancy, um, especially like in the Sound of Freedom era, right? The OK Groomer era. Like, yeah. why is this socially acceptable? I mean, I personally think... I'd love to see retrospectives of all three of their work, but sure. You know, why, why this particular? Um, why is this passable? I don't know. I so I'll be, I'm ashamed to admit I haven't seen. Uh, I didn't grow up on Pee Wee. I kind of missed that era. Um, I think I might see Pee Wee's Big Adventure tomorrow in 35 millimeter for the first time. I've never seen it, but I do know just from like. Um, kind of like film commentators or YouTubers that I follow, like that are kind of more in the Gen X. Uh, he probably had a similar effect to um, Mr. Rogers in the fact that like, he, he was such a staple as Pee Wee for their um, childhood. And like to this day, most people like when they go th through like Tim Burton's um, filmography, it's like still Pee Wee's big adventure is like, still lauded at, as his best movie, which is insane to me. Uh, so there's just definitely just kind of like a nostalgia there that I think people are willing, that it positively impacted uh, their lives as a kid. So it's something you can kind of 
I mean, I, I know loosely of his deviancy, but I don't think it's nearly as bad as like, I mean, Roman Polanski. So it's like something that you can easily, not easily, but like kind of like put aside and just like look at the artists themselves and the Im impact that they had on the culture at the time uh, and still do. So I think that's uh, to answer your, your question there. Yeah, and I mean, I'm I'm looking forward to re catching some of these. I think the interesting thing is Blow with Johnny Depp was a movie they didn't pick for this, um, even though that is probably Paul Rubin's best performance outside of Pee Wee. He's just amazing in the movie Blow from 2001, which I would have loved to have seen in 35 millimeter at a retrospective like this. Um, we've got some yeah. other entries from the Belcourt this week. Um, there's Co Kokomo City, which is a movie about um, black trans sex workers. Um, there's going to be a special presentation from a community activist. So you know where all the white liberals will be this weekend. Um, sure. I'm sure the movie's going to be fine. Uh, it looks actually yeah. pretty miserably compelling. I'm going to take a look at it. Something that I do want to mention this week that just kind of blew me away trailer wise is this new Hindi movie called Jawan. Okay. Um, that's been a massive hit in India. And the trailer for it, again, this is the closest to an 80s action movie we're going to get. I mean, you can look at the style of this movie. It looks completely off the wall. It's got that RRR vibe going to it where it's just this like sure. amazing action with some depth and some actual craft behind it. So, mm -hmm. you know, if I've got the two and a half hours to spare in the next uh, week or so, I'm really looking forward to this. It's playing at AMC Thoroughbred 20 and Regal Hollywood 27. So, um, so yeah, is there anything in the fall besides Thanksgiving you're really looking forward to seeing? Um, well, I didn't know that this movie was coming out and this is more less of the fall, but, uh, in December, I think it's just called the bike riders from Jeff Nichols, who I completely, he's one of the, like, I think he's one of the best filmmakers working today. And then he just disappeared for almost a decade. So it's exciting for me to like, um, see that he's coming out with what looks like a banger with, um, uh, Austin Butler, Michael Shannon, kind of like his typical, uh, collection of actors there. Um, that looks really riveting. Um, I'm hesitant to maybe see The Exorcist Believer. We'll see. I don't know. I'm probably not going to like it. Um, and then, I mean, I forgot I, I forgot there's a new Saw movie coming out. I If that movie's better than The Exorcist Believer, then I'm, I don't know what to think of David Gordon Green. So... I'm a, I'm a ride or die David Gordon Green fan, so yeah. <laughs> I'm hoping. I, I loved what he did with Halloween. Um, I'm also really looking forward to Priscilla, the new Sofia Coppola movie, and right. you know, Exorcist, obviously. So, you know, I, I guess we'll see. We've got some of these actually coming up early screenings during the Nashville Film Festival, which, you know, thanks yeah. to your, your past and your time there, you're going to be able to probably see with me at various mm -hmm. times. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that is our weekly film rundown. Let's hope next week is better. Um, sure. I, I really hope next week is better. But uh, if not, and you really want to get out to the movies, just maybe go to the Belcourt this weekend, see Sorcerer, see the documentary. But if you really want to go see my big fat Greek wedding three and the nun two, then by all means, go do it. Um, yeah. We'll, we'll not be seeing either of us there, I would imagine. At least right. this week. Uh, so yeah, that is our show for today. Jay, thank you so much as always. And, uh, you know, we'll be talking about National Film Festival a lot over the coming weeks. So that's our show. Thanks so much for uh, joining us today. And whatever you do this weekend, give it some thoughts. Bye.